Crime is completely out of control in this country. I mean, just look how bad it is, Liz. Crime is continuing unabated. In New York City, it's up 15% this September over last September. We will not surrender our city to the violent few. By now, it's become almost routine. A hundred or so police officers deploy in the streets of the Neukölln Quarter in Berlin. Deutschland, liebe Kolleginnen und Kollegen, gehört zu den sichersten Ländern der Welt. Und die Politik der letzten Jahre hat dazu beigetragen, dass wir Deutschland noch ein Stück sicherer gemacht haben. We have shared before that we live around the German city of Freiburg im Breisgau a city known as Germany's Green City, a title it takes both literally and figuratively as a center for sustainable technology and living, as well as situated as a gateway between the Black Forest and the Rhine Valley. But just a few years ago, Freiburg had another more frightening title, the city with the highest rate of crime in the German state of Baden-Württemberg. And this was something I found extremely surprising because I mean, sure, yeah, there are a couple of neighborhoods that maybe are a little bit more rough around the edges. And as a woman who would regularly go running in the early morning hours through the city in the dark, you know, I'd be lying if I said there weren't some areas that I generally avoided for safety purposes. But as an American, crime, especially violent crime, in Germany feels like a lot less of an issue, or at least a very different issue. But is it true? Let's take a look. Okay, so before we jump into statistics, I think the first thing we should really cover is the common counter argument to whenever comparisons of crime are brought up. And that's the inherent difficulty it is to find a fair and equal measurement. There are many ways to measure crime, including official statistics and reports from the police and governing bodies, victim surveys, and offender self-reports and surveys. But measuring and defining crime is pretty tricky especially because crime really should be taken within cultural and historic contexts. The easiest and most visible example of this is the long-lasting effects on prohibition in the U.S. Although it was repealed about 90 years ago, it's still a crime to drink in public today in the United States. You can't just open a bottle of beer and drink it as you walk down the street. But in Germany, this is totally legal. But when cultures and countries can actually come to a consensus that a particular act is in fact a crime. Thankfully, we do have pretty good national and international databases that we can pull from. In Germany, the Länder Criminal Police Offices and the Bundeskriminalamt publishes individual data sets annually, which is helpful in understanding crime rates geographically. In the US, the Federal Bureau of Investigation, or the FBI, and the Bureau of Justice Statistics, or the BJS, are the two primary sources for criminal justice statistics that cover a wide range of topics. But even those statistics do come with their problems. For starters, many believe that these statistics aren't actually a good representation of actual crime. In fact, many states significantly underestimate crime. Some crimes go unreported by victims or unrecorded by police. And as a result, some researchers claim that the statistics represent only up to about 25% of actual crime attributing the remaining 75% as what is now termed the dark figure of crime. Plus, even with the same level of analysis within the same country, there's going to be differences in how those statistics are collected. Now, in the US, the Department of Justice approaches the problem in two ways. The FBI's Uniform Crime Reporting Program, or UCR, solicits data from about 20,000 law enforcement agencies around the country. Simultaneously, the Bureau of Justice Statistics National Crime Victimization Survey, or NCVS, interviews about 150,000 nationally representative citizens, asking them whether they have been victims of a crime. Sounds like a great way to cover your bases. But of course, even these do have their problems. Because the UCR draws its data from investigators and the NCVS relies on victims, they can present starkly different pictures of crime. According to the UCR, the incidence of rape nearly doubled from 1973 to 1990. 
The NCVS, by contrast, shows that it declined by around 40% during the same period. So researchers at Vanderbilt University looked into this discrepancy and they found that the upward trend in the UCR data correlated with upticks in the number of female police officers and with the advent of rape crisis centers and reformed investigative styles. It could be, in short, that a modernized approach to the policing of rape drastically increased the frequency with which it was reported, while at the same time still reducing its incidence. Yet coherent stories like this only sometimes emerge from conflicting data. But you know, to be honest, even despite these discrepancies, using crime statistics can still be a really valuable tool, even when looking between countries to understand how crime occurs, how it's reported and handled, and ultimately what that means for the public justice system. Different countries have different methods of policing, different cultures around reporting, and different legislation that ultimately coalesce into very different patterns of crime and perceptions of crime among their communities. And although we should all be hesitant of drawing conclusions on causality, the data from measuring crime can still provide valuable insights into the current state of a society. Okay, so with the giant caveat that you shouldn't take crime statistics on face value, <laughs> there's actually been some pretty interesting developments on crime between the United States and Germany when you look specifically at crime over time. In November 2021, there was a study released by the German government which said that crime has dropped significantly over the past 15 years, prompting the then Interior Minister Horst Seehofer to declare that, quote, Germany is one of the safest countries in the world. So what's behind the decline? The biggest drop in recorded crime came in the category of property crime, which refers to theft and robbery. Over the period in question, recorded crime of this nature dropped by a third, while the value of the stolen property also dropped from 8.5 billion in 2005 to 6.6 .6 billion in 2019. And you know, it's actually quite interesting. Property crime is more prevalent than violent crime in the US, also the same here in Germany, but that too has been on the decline in the United States. In 2019, the FBI reported a total of 2,109.9 property crimes per 100,000 people, compared with 379.4 violent crimes per 100,000 people. By far, the most common form of property crime in 2019 was larceny or theft, followed by burglary and motor vehicle theft. However, like I mentioned, property crime has been on the decline in the United States for decades, and data from both the FBI and the BJS show significant declines since the early 1990s when crime was spiking across the country. So again, although there's going to be some discrepancy here between how crime is defined and categorized, I'd like to give one example just to sort of illustrate a general idea of how crime differentiates between Germany and the United States. If we look specifically at theft of a motor vehicle, which gives us a much more narrow definition of property crime, as reported by the United Nations Office on Drugs and Crime, we can see that in Germany, there are an estimated 58.14 cases per 100,000 people in 2019. Whereas in the same year, the same source estimates that the number is at 219.38 per 100,000 people, roughly four times the instance in the United States. Now, to be fair, part of this difference in crime is likely due to the fact that compared to Americans, Germans own fewer cars, drive them shorter distances, and less frequently because they walk and cycle and ride public transit more often. But even with that difference, this type of crime still seems to be more common in the United States. Germany has roughly 580 vehicles per 1,000 inhabitants, whereas in the US, this is almost 800. Plus, around eight in 10 motor vehicle thefts, almost 80%, were reported to the police in 2019, making it by far the most commonly reported property crime tracked by the BJS. So we actually do have some degree of confidence that the numbers are statistically relevant. Ultimately meaning that while we might not have an exact number, theft of a motor vehicle 
is more common in the United States. Okay, now most of us would probably define violent crime as a crime where a victim is harmed in some way. And that's mostly true. Violent crimes include rape, sexual assault, aggravated robbery, which typically means that a weapon or a threat was involved, and assault and murder. But in reality, in the United States, the state and federal governments actually define violent crime in a pretty broad way including many that don't actually even involve physical harm. In some U.S. states, purse snatching, manufacturing methamphetamine, and stealing drugs are considered violent crimes. Burglary is generally considered a property crime, but an array of state and federal laws classify burglary as violent crime in certain situations, such as when it occurs at night, in a residence, or with a weapon present. So even if the building was unoccupied, someone convicted of burglary could be punished for a violent crime and end up with a long prison sentence and a violent record. So it is worth noting that in Germany, violent crime has a different definition. Specifically, it's defined as intentional homicide, rape or serious sexual assault, robbery and extortion accompanied by violence, dangerous and serious bodily injury, as well as kidnapping for extortion, hostage taking, bodily injury leading to death, and attacks on air traffic. But you know, regardless of how you define it, thankfully violent crime has actually been on the decline for decades now in both the US and Germany. The same 2021 report on crime in Germany over the past 15 years found that violent crime has dropped by 15.4%. And in the US, again, we can observe that violent crime has dropped dramatically. Using the FBI data, the violent crime rate fell by 49% between 1993 and 2019, with large decreases in the rates of robbery, murder or non-negligent manslaughter, and aggravated assault. So what do these rates ultimately look like between the United States and Germany? Well, if we compare instances of homicide, in Germany, there are roughly 0.4 homicides per 100,000 people. Whereas in the United States, it's roughly six per 100,000 people. Now it's worth mentioning, the UN Office on Drugs and Crime, which collected this data from both surveys, as well as counter-referencing statistics from the respective country's criminal justice databases, defines homicide as intentional killing, which simply means you meant to do it even if it wasn't necessarily premeditated. So for reference, this includes first and second degree murder in the United States, but not manslaughter. Whereas in Germany, this would probably be best defined as Mord, but not Totschlag. Because again, the characteristics of murder, which revolve around intent, were not there. So in the last couple of sections, we've been referencing this report from the German government that looked at crime over the last 15 years. And one of the things I personally found the most surprising about this report wasn't necessarily just the change in crime, but also how changes have occurred in how crime has been sentenced in Germany. In Germany, the 15 year developments at this stage of the justice system were also positive, only half the number of minors were found guilty of a crime in 2019 compared to 2005. Meanwhile, if you count all of the convictions in 2019, only 15% were serious enough to lead to a prison term. But you know, where we've actually seen pretty similar trends between Germany and the United States thus far in this video, sentencing is actually where the starkest contrast is going to be. In a typical year, about 600,000 people enter prison gates in the United States, but people go to jail over 10 million times each year. Jail churn is particularly high because most people in jails have not been convicted. Some have just been arrested and will make bail within hours or days, while many others are too poor to make bail and remain behind bars until their trial. Only a small number, about 103,000 on any given day, have actually been convicted and are generally serving misdemeanor sentences under a year. But 
painting a true picture of crime sentencing in the United States is actually really, really difficult because there isn't just one criminal justice system in the US. Instead, we have thousands of federal, state, local, and tribal systems. Together, these systems hold almost 2 million people in about 1,500 state prisons, over 100 federal prisons, over 2,800 local jails, 1,500 juvenile correctional facilities, and 186 immigration detention facilities and 82 Indian country jails, as well as military prisons, civil commitment centers, state psychiatric hospitals, and prisons in the U.S. territories. However, to give a little bit of context here, during March 2015, the federal government reported the convictions of 12,383 individuals for federal crimes. Only slightly more than a third, about 4,630 defendants, were sentenced to prison terms of one year or more. The remainder of those convictions, about 63%, were for offenses that were not judged serious enough to warrant significant prison time. The median sentence was only three months. Half got more, half got less. And of that total, 30.5% received two weeks or less of jail time, including 17.5% that received no jail time at all. On the other extreme, nine individuals were given life sentences. You know, I think the final point making in this video is that there actually is one final statistic that both the US and Germany have surprisingly in common. And that's that despite the fact that crime statistics have actually been on the decline in both countries, our perception of that crime has actually risen. In other words, we tend to think of crime as an ever important and increasing issue. In the US, in 20 of the 24 Gallup surveys conducted since 1993, at least 60% of US adults have said that there is more crime nationally than there was the year before, despite the generally downward trend in national violent and property crime rates during most of that period. However, while perceptions of rising crime at the national level are common, fewer Americans believe crime is up in their own communities. In all 23 Gallup surveys that have included the question since 1993, no more than about half of Americans have said that crime is up in their area compared with the year before. And interestingly, public attitudes about crime actually do fall along partisan lines and differ considerably depending on your race, ethnicity, and other socioeconomic factors. For example, in a 2020 Pew Research Center survey, 74% of registered voters who support Trump said that violent crime was, quote, very important to their vote in that year's presidential election, compared with a far smaller share of Joe Biden's supporters at 46%. And on the flip side of things, in 2017, the German authorities also conducted a similar survey, and the results were quite telling. Although, again, property crime rates have dropped significantly during this time period, their survey showed that domestic burglary is the most feared crime, and the fear of that crime is on the rise. In 2017, one in four, 24%, is fairly or severely worried that someone might break into their apartment or home. In 2012, this was only one in five, or 19%. On the next episode of The Black Forest Family, in my humble opinion, one of the greatest television shows to ever be broadcast in the history of television was The West Wing. Yeah, I fully acknowledge that this makes me a gigantic nerd. But while there are so, so many great episodes, characters, and discussions that happened on The West Wing over its seven seasons that were not only nuanced, but incredibly forward thinking, there is one particular episode that is for sure in my top five, because the discussion that they had in this particular episode is just as relevant today as it was 22 years ago when it debuted in February of 2001. You don't really know what the framers were thinking, do you? No, but I do know that if you combine the populations of Great Britain, France, Germany, Japan, Switzerland, Sweden, Denmark, and Australia, you'll get a population roughly the size of the United States. We had 32,000 gun deaths last year. They had 112. You think it's because Americans are more homicidal by nature? 
Or do you think it's because those guys have gun control laws? That's right, guys. In a video that is probably one of the most requested topics that I cover on our channel, we're finally going to discuss gun control. Does the US truly have a gun violence epidemic? Just how different are the regulations between the US and Germany? And how do other countries manage to keep gun deaths down while still allowing lawful gun ownership to occur? It's a huge topic for sure, and I am so looking forward to hearing your feedback and comments next week. And as always, guys, if you enjoyed this video today, be sure to hit that like button. And for more content from the Black Forest family, hit that subscribe button. So I'll see you next Sunday. Tschüss.